uh, Richard Desmond, uh, University of East Anglia, lecture on modern European history with an interest in digital history and uh, web archives, and also one of the computers. Uh, I'm Paul Dottridge. Uh, I do a lot of work with the University of the Third Age. Uh, I'm Tessa Hosseville. I'm also one of the teaching history from UNS and I'm also from Sir. I'm Adam Crimble. I am at University of Hertfordshire and I teach digital history. Also, here. I'm Martin Steer and I work at the Institute of Historical Research and the technical lead. I'm James Baker. I'm a historian and I'm with the Institute of Seminar and the University of Sussex. I'm John Levin. I'm with the PhD at Sussex on the prism of Tibet, which requires a lot of computing. I'm Philip Carter, I work at the IHR and for many years I work at the NB. I'm Jonathan Blaney, I work at the IHR. I work briefly at the NB uh, and I now work on digital projects here. I'm Matt Philpott, I work at the School of Advanced Studies, which is a on based digital projects. Okay, thank you all very much. And unlike some other chairs we were discussing earlier, I won't be testing you on <laughs> contributions you might be looking for. Okay, so Chris. Okay, good, thanks. Um, uh, before I start, uh, I'm just curious, how many people here who wrote ODNB entries? Is there, I know, I know at least one. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> 259. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, always, always uh, uh, curious um, people's um, uh, involvement with the ODNB. Um, I think uh, everyone here will know of the ODNB, which was called on its release in 2004, the greatest book ever, a more enthralling read than all the no novels ever entered for the Booker Prize put together. Um, the Daily Mail, where these giddy pronouncements appeared, is not known for understatement, but more cautious academic researchers have long held the ODNB in similarly high esteem. Stephen Collini, writing in the London Review of Books, found himself experiencing a rare and wholly unironic feeling that mixes pride and humility with a dash of wonder. When he considered generations to come making use of this vast consolidation of scholarly accuracy for the purposes of their own, which may barely be imaginable to us now. Kalini's response, awe, has until recently arguably been the most appropriately scholarly, scholarly response to the ODNB considered in its entirety. The enormous scope of the ODNB, which is the work of roughly 10,000 scholars, runs to 60 volumes in print and is made up of more than 62 million words, quickly defeats the capacities of even those most eager to praise it. Awe has been the most reasonable scholarly response, that is, until the recent emergence of so-called distant reading. Distant reading is the term first coined by Stanford literary historian Franco Moretti that has now become shorthand for computer-assisted study of corpora whose scale exceeds human capacities. In this paper, I want to argue first that the ODNB offers unparalleled perspective on the broadest changes in elite British culture, and second, that such perspective is uniquely and perhaps even exclusively available by way of computational methods. At the heart of this paper is the question, what can 62 millions of historical writing tell us about elite lives over time. Distant reading the ODNB, I contend, not only gives us a powerful new way to study British history, culture, and historiography, but also indicates new scholarly payoffs at the intersection of digital publishing, programming know-how, and historical research. So this is a um, brief overview of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, the ODNB is now an indispensable scholarly resource for just about every field touching on British history and culture. Yet apart from a brief flurry of scholarship surrounding its 2004 publication, it has rarely itself been the object of scholarly investigation. What then do we know about the ODNB? Even its contributing authors and researchers who use the ODNB daily can sometimes feel like the fabled blind men gathered around an elephant who, each feeling a different part, likened it variously to a wall, a spear, a snake, <coughs> and a tree. When it comes to the ODNB, understanding of local texture far surpasses comprehension of the whole beast. But asking what we know about the ODNB in aggregate isn't merely a rhetorical question either. Andrew Piper has identified a typical response to digital scholarship that he calls the, we already knew that impulse. My um, colleague, Scott Weingart, has written, 
any historical claim to an acceptable question within the historical paradigm can easily be countered with, but we already knew that. Either the question's been around long enough that every plausible claim has been covered, or the new evidence or theory is similar enough to something pre-existing that it can be taken as precedent. The scholarship based on quantitative digital methods, the argument goes, does not contribute new knowledge, but rather gives us the same knowledge via slightly different and perhaps ideologically suspect means. One critic writes of the quantitative quantitatively derived illustrations in a recent book, for instance, as striking as these infographics are in their encapsulations of historical truth, they don't typically tell us anything that we didn't already know. In making such arguments, however, critics of digital history inadvertently create for themselves a new burden. What exactly do these wizened savants always already know? There's a slight hint of a shell game or thimble rig, when it always turns out that we knew that already. Doesn't it seem as though the critics could simply be moving the shell with historical knowledge underneath around just fast enough that we lose track of where it started? More charitably, Matthew Lincoln has suggested that the we already knew that impulse isn't a willful deception, but more of an unavoidable after effect of human cognition. For Lincoln, scholars encountering digital scholarship fall prey to their own otherwise useful skills in matching particular cases to broader concepts and generalities. We're so damn good at coming up with post facto historical explanations to contextualize any given observation, he writes, that we're particularly susceptible to confabulating these post facto rationalizations with the idea that we somehow knew the results of this quantitative work already. Lincoln illustrates the point with a thought experiment in which he makes two mutually exclusive historical arguments using a single data set and its inverse. He doesn't tell us which is the true data set and which is its inverse. But insofar as each argument seems to make sense according to some pre-existing art historical narrative, Lincoln leaves readers to realize that, in at least one of his examples, what they already knew was in fact the very opposite of the true data. Lincoln may indeed be right that post-factualism is, is more a matter of scholarly pattern matching gone awry than sleight of hand. But in any event, it seems salutary, epistemologically speaking, to try to say in advance what we already know. Piper has even cheekily proposed what he calls a cultural analytics betting pool to put the rest that we already knew that impulse, where people are 100% right after the fact. Now, I won't go as far as to suggest turning this August seminar into a lab rose, but I do want to pose some questions about the ODNB at the outset and invoke uh, folks both here and uh, watching online to make some initial guesses before I show the answers. This would be brave. Of course, because the guessers risk exposing, either to themselves or to others, that what they thought they knew about the ODNB might not be the case. On the flip side, there's the inevitable glory if it turns out you're right. The point in any case is to try to erect some kind of barrier in front of the already knew that, we already knew that impulse, to postpone self-congratulation on what it is we already know, at least until the plaudits are demonstrably earned. So then, some questions which my presentation will endeavor to answer in what follows, but this is a chance to sort of think about what it is we already know. What's the chronological distribution of ODNB entries? That is, how many entries per century? Are there, say, more 17th century biographies or 19th century biographies? Do patterns match demographic trends? What year is the ODNB's high watermark? when most of its biographical subjects were alive? What's the ODMB's chronological midpoint, which I'm defining as the year when we find exactly half of the words dedicated to subjects born before this date and half dedicated to subjects born afterwards? Does the ratio of married subjects rise or fall over time? What single year in the 16th century saw the most deaths of ODMB subjects? What's, what single year saw the most deaths of ODMB subjects overall? What single scholarly article is cited twice as much as any other scholarly article cited in the ODMB? What's the most cited monograph? What are ODMB subjects' parents' most common occupations? What are the most typical areas of renown for ODMB subjects? When was the last abbess to merit an ODNB bio? What century gives us the ODNB's first political wife? Is a monarch's biography more likely to mention places outside the British Isles or a scientist? When scholars write about theater history, do they write more about people or about places? 
what single sentence appears most often in women's biographies, and which single year is mentioned most frequently in the entirety of the ODNB. Before I um, turn to the answers to these questions, I want to say a word about what makes the answers possible in the first place. In his Leslie Stephen special lecture of 2004, Sir Keith Thomas observed, it's hard to think of any aspect of the British past which will not be illuminated by running a word search of this colossal database. Thanks to Joe Payne, Philip Carter, and a research bursary from the ODNB, the version that I'm using in richly marked up digital format allows for far more than word searches. Meticulously encoded in the markup language known as SGML, the text of the ODNB is easily sortable and queryable according to its highly detailed scheme. In this format, the ODNB is a goldmine for computational methods. Uh, a couple examples may suffice to suggest the exciting range of questions this corpus will support, in addition to the questions that I've already posed. Consider the tag wealth. Famously, ODNB editors ask each of their contributors to include for their uh, subjects individuals' wealth at death, defined either as an official record or other valuation. The existence of wealth tags means that an enterprising economic historian can scoop up thousands of data points almost instantaneously and calculate, albeit cautiously, the total wealth of individuals with ODNB entries. Um, in a very different register, we might consider the BAP tag referring to a date of baptism. What can we learn about long-term patterns concerning community, multiculturalism, and secularization simply by attending to rates, rates of baptism in prominent lives across time? It's important to honor and emphasize the enormous manual labor that went into tagging the ODNB. I have to say, this is quite simply the most uh, useful markup I've encountered as a scholar. For the 2004 release, OUP supplied external contractors with a 285 document of markup instruction, uh, 285 page document of markup instructions with detailed plans for marking dates, places, variant names, legal cases, religious dominations, and much else. The results exhibit the inevitable human errors, but miraculously few. As if to confirm Joe Gouldy and David Armitage's remark in the Historian's Manifesto, that historians turning their attention to big data can simultaneously pioneer new frontiers of data manipulation and make historical questions relevant to modern concerns, it's possible to create valuable structured data sets, data sets using little more than a Python library, um, the Python library beautiful soup to parse the markup. The ODNB markup is most certainly not the work of disembodied algorithms, but of meticulous, judicious, flesh and blood humans whose unglamorous but absolutely central prior work in tagging and editing fundament fundamentally underpins the research that I present here. As Shoemaker and Hitchcock have noted, no doubt alluding to excessively quantitative histories of the 1970s, the analysis of big data risks making digital history inaccessible, technocratic, and in some ways irrelevant for a wider audience. So at the risk of stating the obvious, I am not an algorithm either. The questions that I ask and the methods for answering them follow from my peculiar mix of historical interests, cultural biases, and technical skills. In my case, the distance of distant reading is more than an allusion to Franco Moretti's method. As a mixed heritage American literary scholar studying British history and cultural from across an ocean, I cannot help but approach the ODNB from a distance. British history and culture can look very different depending on one's proximity to Britain, and like the majority of the ODNB's global Anglophone readers, I'm ultimately an interested but implicated outsider. Some examples from my geography. I was born in Rochester, New York, raised in Maryland, and reside now in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I've lived amidst the legacy of the ODNB's um, subjects long before I knew about the ODNB. My living as a professor of English at Carnegie Mellon University, named after Gilded Age industrialist Andrew Carnegie, a first generation Scots immigrant from a radical Chartist family of weavers, and Andrew Mellon, a second generation Scots Irish banker with family roots in County Tyrone, Ireland, who had become US ambassador to the UK. At once too far from Britain to do daily work in its physical archives, and too enmeshed in British culture to turn elsewhere. I resort to the computational prosthetic of distant reading to help make sense of the global historical force that has influenced not only my life, but the lives of so many around the world. So now I'm gonna turn to uh, a little, uh, a less formal version and sort of go through uh, this Jupyter notebook and see some of the broadest outlines of elite lives at scale. So let's start with the shape of the beast. Where are ODNB subjects born? 
here we see that the vast majority are born in England um, with substantial chunks uh, in Scotland, Ireland, Wales, Germany, the USA, and so forth. Um, the geography of death looks relatively similar. Um, and here's another way of um, looking at it. So feel free to stop me if there's uh, something that catches your eye here. Um, I'm, I'm going to be presenting a lot of uh, charts like this, um, or charts in general. Um, but I'm happy to stop and uh, answer questions. OK. Um, so now let's think about um, the lives over time. So this is the estimated UK population over time in tens of millions. We have sort of a uh, broad rise um, coming, uh, rising from uh, about 1600. Um, to what extent does the ODNB mirror this pattern or depart from it? This is the number of ODNB entries by approximate years of birth and death. One of the things that uh, stands out here demographically, of course, is the 17th century, right? You have this um, seemingly considerable overrepresentation of uh, 17th century figures um, relative to the general demographics. <laughs> so, what are the uh, particular spikes for subjects alive per year? So, 1642 is the 17th century high mark. Then it sort of starts retreating, um, and then and then uh, 1925 is the uh, general high, that is to say, that um, that represents the years when most subjects are alive. Um, but what happens if we start to think about men's entries and women's entries? What we see here is um, a roughly similar pattern among men's entries, but women's entries um, really rise consistently towards 1922. Um, and uh, this might be obvious already, but um, the reason that there's the sharp uh, drop off going towards 2000 is that uh, people aren't dead yet. Um, so um, that's that's the many 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 of those many of those people as we get closer to the present, um, of course, will get entries because the ODNB continues to update. Um, but I think that's uh, remarkable. Um, in particular, the relationship bet between the way that uh, the number of women's entries sort of um, bump up these uh, general numbers in the early 20th century. Okay. Um, so let's pay attention to uh, years of death. Um, we have some interesting uh, moments, uh, particularly peaks, some, some of which we might expect, some which we wouldn't. Um, so the answer to the question, which 16th century year uh, includes the most deaths, this is 1558. This is the year that uh, Elizabeth takes the throne from Mary. Um, and uh, this includes um, Protestant martyrs. It includes um, many other different kinds of deaths, but it's, but it's remarkable as, as a kind of... Um, uh, inflection point. Um, 1908 is the year that, that uh, has the, the most deaths overall. Um, 1649 and 1660 are uh, relatively um, self-explanatory as sort of major years in the um, revolution and uh, restoration. Um, uh, 1908, um, this as far as I can tell, is uh, just a question of demography. That, that is to say, there's a huge peak in the number of uh, subjects that are born um, in sort of the 1830s, 1840s, um, and, they, and they sort of are uh, dying, many of them, right about 1908. 
Okay, so to what extent are these years uh, specific to ODMB subjects, and to what extent do they uh, reflect broader patterns? These are general uh, mortality rates in England and Wales for that um, same time period. 1920 is uh, um, high mortality. Uh, 1908 is not not particularly high. Um, so there's there's some there's something sort of unique to the ODMB here about about 1908 uh, presenting itself. Um, Okay, so um, let's let's think about um, you know other other sort of ways that we can think about uh, the ODNB in its entirety as a sort of object of study. Um, we can divide up its words by when subjects are born. The midpoint here is 1785. Um, half of the words are dedicated to people who lived beforehand, and half afterwards. Um, and now the question of uh, subjects married. Um, I don't know how many uh, people said to themselves that they thought more people were married or less people were married. Um, basically, since about 1800, we've got this um, pretty consistent, uh, it's 800, we've got this pretty consistent rise of uh, marriage, um, such that um, getting towards the present, nearly 100% of people in the ODNB uh, were married. Um, as people in this room uh, likely know, the ODMB uh, revised many of the entries for the 2004 publication, um, and this is the percentage of those biographies uh, according to life dates. Um, so we see sort of uh, a, good, a good number getting towards 40% of the um, 18th and 19th century biographies that are uh, revised. Okay, I'm going to turn now to uh, a different way of um, understanding this beast of the ODNB, and this is occupations, historical significance, and areas of renown. So the ODNB categorizes its biographies among 25 areas of renown. So when you simply count um, how many people are in each of those areas, you get a graph that looks something like this. Um, politics, government, and diplomacy is the largest category, followed by literature, journalism, and publishing. Um, down at the end, down at the bottom, um, sports, games, and pastimes, technology, those have the fewest entries. Um, but we have over 12,000 entries uh, that can broadly be classified as politics, government, and diplomacy. Um, so there's more to say uh, about these uh, areas of renown. And in fact, those are sort of helpful buckets to put in uh, the various biographies in, in order to sort of understand more. So um, if we ask how long are the biographies, who's likely to have longer biographies? Um, the answer, perhaps unsurprisingly, is that royalty, rulers, and aristocracy have the longest biographies. Um, I'll show the, uh, that's, this, that's the number of words down there at the bottom. Um, business and finance have uh, relatively long biographies in film and broadcasting. Um, the shortest biographies belong to fields like medicine, music, agriculture and food, religion and belief. Um, so uh, I think we can imagine that um, the tropes of historiography differ depending upon the kind of li life that's being uh, narrated. So um, which kinds of biographies uh, fall more to the sides of emphasizing people and which fall more to the sides of emphasizing places? That's actually a question with uh, a, an observable answer. Um, in this case, the biographies related to music, theater and entertainment, literature, journalism, and publishing um, are weighted much more strongly towards people um, transport and communication, travel and exploration, um, these are weighted much more towards places, but we, we see a sort of interesting spread there of um, the uh, sort of modes of historiography. Um, when we tell the lives of, for example, um, army officers, um, we, don't tell the, we don't tell the lives of uh, their social relations, we tell the lives of the places they were stationed, the places of battle, and so forth. Um, 
So um, beyond the areas of renown, each ODNB subject has a more granular historical significance. These descriptions can be quite precise and very widely. There's no controlled vocabulary here, so you have, you have to sort of um, do uh, some um, aggregating on you know, often used terms. But this is the, this is, these are um, historical significance of 100 more examples. Um, so the most prominent is army officer, politicians up there as well. Um, many writers, um, one thing to, to note here, the number of Church of England, England clergymen, um, which is the number, you know, probably six or seven uh, in terms of ranked historical significance. Um, we can ask similar questions, which um, in, namely when we write about these figures with, with each of these uh, particular professions or occupations, um, are we likely to include a lot of names or not? Um, it turns out when we write about magnates, we include a large average of names. Um, the same is true of courtiers um, and actors and actresses. Um, theater history is, is incredibly social in its, in its historiography. Um, and then when we normalize for biography length, we can see just how these sort of compare with one, with one another. Um, basically, uh, above this line, we see uh, engravers, portrait painters, translators, um, actresses and actors. These are the kinds of uh, professions um, that when we uh, write about them, we talk about other people, geologists, Air Force officers, um, philosophers. These, these seem to demand fewer mentions of other people. Okay, um, so one of the things that we can do with this data is to ask um, about the uh, rise and fall of particular professions or occupations. So um, what I'm doing here is asking about um, when a particular occupation first came on the scene. So when, when do we get uh, the first author, when do we get the first aviator? In this case, um, I'm limiting it to women. Um, so the question I posed earlier, when was the last abbess? That, the answer is that is Margaret Radcliffe, born in 1582. Who were the first political wives? 18th century figures, Catherine Pelham and Hester Pitt. But beyond that, um, this is a little hard to see, and I apologize. Uh, maybe I'll make it, um, that doesn't help. Um, um, I'll try to make it uh, bigger. Um, beyond that, we can see um, when female uh, occupations or historical significance sort of come into the picture. Um, so, uh, at the top, author, abbess, princess, noblewoman, um, magnate, royal mistress, landowner. Um, these are the uh, fields with uh, relatively early appearances and long durations. Um, and then we can see as we move on, sort of in the 17th century, we have the first Quaker preacher. Um, we have uh, daughter of Oliver Cromwell. <laughs> um, we have uh, the first businesswoman. Um, and, and here's our political wife. Uh, in the 18th century. Um, what, what we can see as we sort of move closer to the present, of course, is the emergence of um, new fields, um, new categories of uh, occupation. Um, tennis player, aviator. Um, but also interesting here is the emergence of older fields that are here for the first time, uh, that here for the first time merit inclusion uh, for women, hotter. First potter to be included in the 20th century, uh, first female potter to be included is a 20th century uh, potter. Um, okay, so um, moving on, what are the ODMB subjects' parents' most common occupations? Um, in the case of women, women's mothers tend to be actresses, uh, noble women or teachers. Men's mothers tend to be gentlewomen, noblewomen, and school teachers. Men's fathers tend to be landowners, 
Church of England clergymen and merchants. We can um, also ask, uh, take the approach of asking what years and words and sentences appear frequently. So, um, what years are mentioned most frequently in the ODNB? The year mentioned most often is 1914. Um, I won't, I won't ask people what they guessed uh, at this point, but I, but I am curious. Um, 1919, 1939, 1945. Um, not terribly surprising um, once we see it, but it's also quite easy to create a post facto <laughs> justification. Um, 1642, 1660, 1688, big years, of course. Um, what are the most frequently appearing words, years, and sentences in women's biographies? The most um, frequently appearing sentence, <laughs> which appears in 51 biographies, she never married. Um, and, I, and I should say, and uh, I'm sure Philip could, could confirm that in, in part this is, this is uh, a function of the uh, form that authors were given when, when they had to write the biographies. That is, that is, one had to give an account of their marital status. Um, but the, the frequent years, 1939, 1914, 1919, 1920, um, definitely sort of uh, heavily weighted towards the 20th century, of course. Um, what are the most frequently appearing words years in men's biographies? Men's years, 1914, um, most frequent sentence, they had no children, 311 biographies. He was survived by his wife in 206 biographies. Um, he never married in 112 biographies. Okay, so now I'm going to turn to uh, a section on historiography. What are the most frequently cited books in the ODMV? Well, here they are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Far and away, the winner is, of course, the DND. Um, and and um, some other, uh, you know, sort of standard resources that, that we would expect. Um, so this, this is, uh, in some sense, illuminating, in some, some, some senses, unsurprising. Um, it gets interesting to me, at least, when we start asking about the uh, post-war scholarship, modern scholarship, um, and uh, monographs. So, which post-war book titles influenced the ODMB most strongly? Um, the one that uh, wins is the one in the stage, 1660 to 1800, um, and that's cited over 400 times. Uh, various other um, important um, reference works. Um, Chris, can you read a few out? Sorry, what? Can you read a few out? Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, the, the Dictionary of Art, that's, that's the second. The Register of Admissions to Middle Temple. A Dictionary of British and Irish Travelers in Italy, 1701-1800. The Seminary Priests. A New History of Ireland. The Commissioned Sea Officer of the Royal Navy. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, hap I'm happy to read out as, as needed. Um, what are the most cited post-war monographs? Well, when, when we sort of uh, look, look through these and figure out which ones are the monographs, um, Muir's Britain and the Defeat of Napoleon, 1807 to 1815, is the single most cited monograph in the ODMB, followed by Peter Collinson's The Elizabethan Puritan Movement, and then uh, General McCulloch's uh, Thomas Cranmer. Which book authors are most cited in the ODNB? And this is this is, um, I think, I think it always uh, fascinating to look at because very few of these are 20th century writers, um, 20th 21st century. Um, Joseph Foster, I, I assume that's the. Um, I haven't actually looked, but that's that's the uh, Cambridge and Oxford alumniensis um, Walpole, right? Um, I think the first, do I have this right? Is the, is the first 
20th century historian Peter Collinson. Is it Andy Wood? Uh, I think I think that's uh, the 17th century. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. When we look at uh, post-1945 publication date, um, here we start to see some uh, modern historians. Um, why are we seeing Boswell and Swift here? These are just sort of editions. Uh, post-1945 editions that are cited. Um, so which journal article is cited twice as many times as its next closest neighbor? The answer is Sidney Hutchinson's The Royal Academy of Schools, 1768 to 1830. Uh, followed, followed by these uh, other articles. Um, and then when we look at the most frequently cited article authors in the ODMB, there's Hutchinson, uh, the art historian Mary Edmund, uh, second. Um, many of you will know some of these names that I don't. Um, I'm going to uh, conclude, um, not because it's the last thing that one could do with this data, but it's uh, an illuminating place to finish on the topic of religion. So um, let's have a look at um, how different uh, denominations emerge and fall. Um, in, in ODNB data. So Anglican entries as a percentage of all ODNB entries over time. Um, by, by, this, by this graph, it looks like the Reformation starts in the late 15th century, which, which is a little odd. That's because I'm going with uh, birth dates. Um, but but I, think, I think that uh, we, can, we can infer what's going on here. This is, this is the um, Reformation. Um, Catholic entries as a percentage of ODNB entries over time. Presbyterian. Um, and I, sh I should say that these uh, denomination groups are the ODNB's own denomination groups. So I'm going to put them all together down here. <clears throat> um, one thing that that sort of may be hard to notice here um, has to do with um, the sort of dominance, but also role of Catholicism, um, sort of post-Reformation. So um, here, what, what we get is sort of uh, Christianity um, and sort of major faith categories over time. Uh, there are not a lot of non-Christian entries in the ODMB. Um, but once we sort of take the Church of England out of it for, for the purposes of uh, this. Um, we, can, we can see the um, Church of England just sort of um, far and above the, all of the other sort of uh, categories here. Um, the Church of England is dominant between 1600 and 18. Um, but let's do the same thing and leave the Church of England out of it, modifying the dates a little to see the period 1700 to 1900. Um, here we get sort of a more granular view um, and we, we actually see uh, the sort of interesting um, local rise of Catholicism um, in the 19th century, right, Anglo-Catholicism, Cardinal Newman, and so forth. Um, let's see.
there is um, quite a bit more uh, that we could say about this data. And, and actually, actually um, I'm happy to um, do some queries uh, on the spot if there are particular questions um, that have arisen. Um, I think I think that's uh, yeah. I think that's where I will wrap up for now. Um, I, I'm going to I'm going to end sort of um, with a bit of a caution, though. Um, the first question before my caution is: Did we learn anything? Did we learn anything that we didn't know before? Um, I hope the answer is yes. I assume the answer is yes. Um, but I nevertheless want to end on a cautionary note, and it's this. I started by arguing that the distant, distant reading the ODNB only gives us uh, a powerful, not only gives us a powerful new way to study British history, culture, and historiography, and also indicates new scholarly payoffs at the intersection of digital publishing, programming know-how, and historical research. All of that is indeed true. Yet in order to understand what an approach like this one offers, it's never less important to understand what it cannot do. Even in its entirety, the ODNB is not a pure pipeline to the past, but a highly mediated artifact shot through with several kinds of biases, blind spots, and assumptions. Once we notice that some years are mentioned far more frequently than others, that 1914 is the year mentioned most often in the ODNB, that nine of the top 10 years mentioned most frequently are in the 20th century, and that the years mentioned most frequently in men's lives differ from those mentioned in women's lives, we can begin to wrap our heads around some of the ODMB's implicit biases. Now, this is not a criticism at all. This is merely to note that any claims to be made about the past as such must begin with a clear-eyed sense of ways that the ODNB does and does not represent that past. Indeed, it may be that the most important thing we now know is where we can most effectively dedicate our own scholarly efforts in order to enhance and supplement rather than merely reproduce the ODMB's distinctive picture of elite lives at scale. Thanks very much. Thank you. Wow. Um, that's absolute rock for the information and some very important questions that are coming out already. But I will first off open up to the floor. So I'm sure particular people in the room must have. Some questions. John. First, obvious question: uh, Is the stage accessible to Lady Slotton and I? I'm I'm not I'm not uh, at liberty to to share it. Uh, that that is up to OUP. Um, so uh, I I have access to it uh, through um, uh, my colleague Joe Payne uh, at OUP, who um, was uh, helping me to. Um, work with the Six Degrees of Francis Bacon project, um, and uh, and then subsequently through a research bursary through um, the ODNB. So those are the auspices under which I have access to it. Um, just add to that, though, I did um, ask the ODNB a couple of years ago for a date, and, and they were quite happy to do some for the research practice. So I my experience was very close to presumably had to sign the. I think actually, I don't know if I actually did sign it in the end, but I thought I'd have to. <laughs> I think I've <laughs> <think they're laughs> yeah, forgotten, but I think in theory, they just trust me. <laughs> okay. okay, so this is a question about occupations. Um, I wonder how far you connected the work you've been doing thus far, and I know this is about to take a going for work, um, with. Um, relatively substantial, but I'm not going to say I know a huge amount about it, um, literature on how you deal with occupations as categories of analysis of what's mm. work. And one of, the, one of the reasons I mentioned that is because, for example, one of the things you said was that um, engravers seem to be a very social category uh, in, in terms of the biographies. I don't disagree necessarily, it's an area that I know quite well, and they are quite social people by nature of their occupation. And yet, at the same time, engraver is a category that frankly is a large bucket for a whole bunch of different practices for a long period of time. Um, and so when you were talking about um, occupation, one thing that struck me was that many of the occupations you talked about were quite specific. 
Um, obviously, they're starting to go into the change of this line, but many are quite specific. Um, but some others could be the ones that are sort of labeled upon people in ways that go beyond their specific job category. So I'm just wondering how, as this project develops, how do you intend to kind of deal with some of those issues, or whether those issues are so irreconcilable that it's very hard to kind of do anything meaningful with the job category stuff that um, they will be already tagged for you very hopefully, um, but may not be as useful as possible in constant work given. The significance, I guess, is if people are going to get Right. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so I would I would say that one of the um, important distinctions is the sort of broad categories of areas of renown um, and the historical significance categories, um, which which in some cases, as you know, are um, you know usefully described as occupations, and in other cases, they're not. Um, so it, it, working working uh, with this many data points, um, I'm, I'm sort of uh, happy to put myself at the mercy of the of the work that the ODMB has already done. Um, that that is to say, the number the number of engravers in here is you know going to be in the, in the hundreds. Um, you know, categorizes uh, engravers. Um, so I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to get more granular than. Uh, these already very granular historical significance um, group uh, labels. Um, having said that, there are uh, all kinds of interesting digital techniques that you can that you can use to um, clump these uh, biographies in different ways. Right? You could you could imagine topic modeling them. Um, you could imagine um, you know, running through a neural network, right? You could, you could imagine sort of finding um, sort of clusters and mod modularity um, that, that sort of find new affinities um, in people who have different kinds of uh, historical significances, right? Um, so uh, I, I think that, you know, that's, that's, that's work that I'm sort of happy to leave to, to others insofar as this is, um, you know, this is not going to be the uh, the end of this work by any means. Um, I think I think that what we what I'm after here is sort of the, the broad outlines, the broad brushstrokes, um, and um, you know, which is something that I don't think we've quite had available before. Um, and so, to the extent that we can say something about this sort of blurry category of engravers. Um, you know, I, I feel as though that's that's um, of course not perfect, but it's. it's Something that might be useful. Can I follow up? I guess I'm not. I'm not necessarily saying that I'm interested in, in getting more granular. Actually, I'm, I kind of say that I'm about more or more blurry. So, so is it okay? What can we do with occupations when there's a variety of different categorizations? Well, the, idea, the obvious thing would be to then say, do we work with the categories that come out of social science, and how social scientists work with occupations, and move into kind of bigger, broader buckets, <coughs> or Dependent on which set of social science principles, different sets of buckets. That's, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. so, so, is this then about not worrying about those things and actually just doing the data that we have and saying, this is what we can extract from ODMB to say what ODMB says? Mm -hmm. Or is it about then trying to refactor this data um, into, to fit into existing traditions of scholarship and showing how perhaps they're problematic as well? Because they are categories that people have arbitrarily decided are linked to each other in certain ways, and maybe data shows different connections. That's kind of where I'm kind of going. This is about there are there are other ways of understanding how you find occupations out there. Yeah. Um, how does only really fit with that? Is that something that's that's important to you to engage with, or actually do you not care about occupations particularly and you're just going to deal with what's there and kind of focus on other kind of categories that come up there? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I suppose that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to the extent that I'm able to, to really keep my eyes on the object that is the ODNB, that, that, that is not, not to try to um, un understand it in relation to all other possible schemas. This is, this is uh, large enough for my purposes um, that, that I uh, am sort of curious about what the ODNB is itself as an object um, and, and how it can be um, used uh, and studied for the many scholars who themselves use the ODMB to contextualize what it is that they're using it for. Mm -hmm. I was actually just going to add to that. 
pretty much leading on from, uh, from what James was saying, have you, oh, actually it struck me a lot of the noise in there was from ODMB authors, um, both in terms of occupation and notice, especially with religion, sort of separate categories, but Catholic and Roman Catholic. Um, so, so to follow on from James' suggestion, perhaps using the Hisco classifications would be a good way of, you know, there's publisher and engraver, engraver yes. and publisher yes, yeah. mm -hmm. are being diffused yes. out, yeah. but by using the Hisco tables, you could, um, yeah, that's, that, you know, I think I think that that's a, that's a nice suggestion, and maybe maybe I need to sort of uh, take that on board more than I have so far uh, done. Um, I don't think I, I mind it, any of your points, but I think it might improve the clarity. Yeah, no, I I, I, I appreciate that. In, in in the sense that we, we lose something when when we do that, right? Um, that is, that is, it's it's quite interesting that there's this distinction between Catholic and Roman Catholic. Um, and it's, it's in, in fact a meaningful distinction, right? Because Roman Catholic more or less emerges sort of post-Reformation as, as a, a category. And it's, that's not exclusive, by the way. I mean, I've noticed that there are uh, 11th century Roman Catholic uh, biographies. So, so as you say, it's, it's sort of noisy. Um, but when, when someone comes across a biography um, that's, that's uh, tagged as Roman Catholic, you know, it's it's actually important and useful to understand what that term means in the context of the OGMB, right? So, so there, that's you know, perhaps I'm um, tiptoeing towards an intellectual justification for keeping these these categories, mm -hmm. um, or or at least um, work working within the the um, general parameters that the the, the OUP has. Um, you know, already already created, um, but but I, I do I do I do take the point. I'm going to think about it. No, I'm sorry, I'm taking the product of it. That leads me to another question, which is how many of these things might you be able to um, isolate as artifacts of edited versus unedited original DMB articles versus ODMB articles? Could that distinction between Catholic and Roman Catholic actually at least partially explained by whether it's being written? For the original edition, or whether that's something which is being by the modern author. Yeah, I, I hadn't I hadn't thought to uh, ask that question. So I, I do I do have in the data whether whether the uh, article is revised or not. Um, I don't know, and Philip may know um, whether the historical significances uh, of the original ODMB entries or the original DMB entries were revised or not. Uh, no, I think my understanding is that all of the terms that you're looking at were really created in 2004. Right. So there was no equivalent mm -hmm. the There were headwords, occupation categories were both, and that would be an interesting comparison between how do you, you know, in a way, this is a study of two very big generations of historical scholarship approaching a similar subject. Yeah. And, At the ODMB, I was one of the people whose job was to try and make it consistent. And I was really frustrated because I felt that all the attention went on traditional copy editing mm -hmm. and there was no attention given to consistency of tacking. Mm -hmm. So I was interested in what you were saying about the tagging being really good. Mm -hmm. And as I remember, and it's a long time ago, I thought particularly things like place tagging was very erratic. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you had any conclusions from looking at those tags about where the kind of interest when in, when they were defining the schema. Mm. I'm guessing that the, the stuff that really interested them was all the stuff in the headword and perhaps in references and so on, and the stuff scattered out through the, the, the free text. 
was really pretty much a well, just a less interesting thing. So that's that's uh, helpful, and and I think um, you are articulating one reason why I haven't talked very much about places, um, because it's it's the place data is very difficult to work with, um, and and I, and I and I haven't formulated to myself the the thought that um, it's because the tagging is um, irregular. It's just it's just the problem of historical places, right? right? That that. Um, you know, places, place names change, and places are given different, described with different granularity. Um, so, you know, for example, I don't think I've ever come across a place name that's not tagged as a place. Um, so that's that's you know quite good. Um, but um, you know, how how do you work at all these sort of different levels of granularity uh, at the same time? I mean, so here um, for the birth and death places, you know, I'm just working with the country data because you know county data. I mean, that, that just um, is is sort of far too messy. Um, you know, but what you, what you see, of course, is you know all, all kinds of sort of uh, you know classic disambiguation kinds of kind of uh, challenges here. Um, I think that um, there's a very interesting distinction that the editors made in the tagging to classify places in two ways, British Isles versus non-British Isles. Um, so there is there is a tag for, for every place that categorizes it uh, as one of those two, and I think that's a really uh, useful tag, and, and, actu and actually, um, in, in some sense, gets at um, what, what I've sort of uh, come to appreciate as, as actually an internationalist um, dimension to the uh, ODNB. If you, if you um, read sort of Colin Matthew, um, the kinds of things that he was sort of saying and writing, um, you know, he, he was he was quite interested that the um, ODNB sort of reflect something broader than um, you know, sort of small England, um, and uh, to the extent that that's I think encoded in the tagging scheme. That is, there's a sort of quick and easy way to access sort of non-British Isles geographies. Um, you know, it makes it possible to to study and understand. Uh, uh, Britain in the life of the world, um, in I think a um, pretty powerful way. Um, yeah, so I think I think that's what I, that's what I would say. Um, you know, that's a, that's a, that's an important um, bit of foresight that that went into that tagging. Uh, and it's interesting to hear you say you were frustrated um, with the process. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative of all the labors that went in. <laughs> I felt that a lot of the effort on the, the copy editing was really geared at the, the book, yeah. you know, how the book would appear, mm -hmm. and how search terms would work, but not search terms would be able to so. so when I tried to argue that, I think people thought the main priority was to make the spelling consistent. Yeah, I, I, I suppose that I take for granted that the spelling is consistent <laughs> and, and it's well copy edited, so yeah. Doesn't. Um, can I ask a little bit about the your questions that you put <laughs> to this corpus. I mean, did you? How did you come up with them? Did you? Did you just have general hunches, or did you think this might be interesting? Let's look at this or that, or did you really think through how can I bring about ideological bias or anything through my questions? So how did you prepare these questions, or how did you? Yeah, go about formulating this. Yeah, there's there's a sort of hermeneutic circle here in, in which you know uh, I, I'm sort of in some sense sort of trying to confirm the things that I think I already know mm -hmm. in order to feel um, good about the new things that I learn, mm -hmm. right? So uh, in, in in some sense, um, you know, when I'm working with the with the um, uh, bibliographical data. You know, I'm, I'm trained uh, in the 17th century, so I know the 17th century <laughs> history best. You know, so you know, I, I look at what are the what are the books that are cited in the uh, 17th century um, biographies, and oh yeah, so this this makes sense. This is good, and so now now I can sort of uh, feel as though the, the things that are surprising are gen genuinely surprising, right? Because I'm seeing some things that I expect and other things that, that um, I I don't. Um, you know. I'm um, aware of the, the ways in which that I'm working within the, the tagging scheme. Um, I, I um, can imagine fighting against it in, in different ways, but like gender is tagged, religion is tagged, um, 
citations are tagged. Um, I think that in some sense this is the low hanging fruit of this project. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll own that. I'll own that as sort of telling us what what we you know can get at most easily because we haven't had it already. Um, and uh, these are sort of general things that um, I suspect you know, users of the ODNB would care about. Um, broadly, I'm, I'm interested, I suppose, in historiography, identities, and networks. Mm -hmm. um, and you know those those are kind of the three main sort of general areas that that uh, guide my uh, questions, um, and to the extent that um, I'm able to sort of uh, confirm some of the things that I think I already know there, um, that's a good thing, and and sort of surprise myself with new things. That's, that's I suppose what I'm after. I thought that was really interesting. Um, I have a lot of questions and a lot of comments, but I guess I'll I'll start with. The who are you studying question, and you picked up on this a few times, and your comment picked up on this. Are you doing 21st century history? Are you studying Philip and Jonathan? Mm -hmm. Are you are you doing history here? You said you, you do 18th or 17th century history, and you're based in an English literature, probably. So, who are you studying? Because I'm just thinking of, of my experience with um, peer reviewers in particular. Mm -hmm. and, um, I think that they would say, well, you've, you've done a study of a 21st century corpus, you've not studied history, and I'm thinking, how would I use this? I would use this to show my students what the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography is, what's the shape of it, so that they understand when they're reading it, what they're going to find, what they're not going to find. But what does this tell us about history in, in the sense of the study of, of the past? So are you, doing a, are you doing a history, or are you doing a history of digital humanities, which is happens to be 2004. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and I am uh, find, find myself going back and forth on that quite a bit. Um, you know, I think I'm taking a, a, a literary approach um, to the ODNB. That, that is to um, understand it as an object worthy of uh, scholarly attention in, in the way that a literary scholar might attend to a poem. Um, or uh, a novel, um, or in some case, a, a corpus of uh, a lot of novels. Um, and um, as with literary texts, there is some relation to history. That is, uh, any literary text bears some relation to um, the period in which it was composed, um, a, a sort of um, underlying historical reality um, that's sort of represented in the in the document um, of, of a poem or a novel um, and so I suppose what uh, really interests me is sort of determining um, the places in which what we see when we look at the ODNB is, is a sort of pure artifact and the places in which um, it's uh, indexing however skewed a manner some historical reality. Um, so, so you do, you know, I, I do bring in sort of the demographic data. I'm trying very hard not to become a historical demographer with this project, um, you know, but, but in some cases it, it um, is important to, you know, to determine what it is that we're looking at. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think that that's, uh, so if you're going to write an article and yeah. submit it to a journal, yeah. what type of journal would you approach with this one? Yeah, so um, I, I thought about this question, in fact. Uh, you're looking to do that. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, when, when, I, when I write this up. Um, you know, and, and I've thought about who would care about it. It's something like the, an interdisciplinary uh, journal at the Journal of British Studies. Um, something like, um, you know, I don't, I don't know if... Uh, the historical journal would or wouldn't be interested in something like this. Um, there are a lot of people who uh, use the ODMB quite frequently and would like to know more about it. Um, so, um, I don't know, do you have any suggestions? Well, I think you're right. There are a lot of people that would use it and find it interesting. I think you're going to have a hard time publishing this in a historical journal. And maybe I'm wrong about that, but I think you'll find historians say, this isn't history. This is this is about a twenty first century collection. Mm. Is it not information study? Is that what you're? Would you not think a kind of library mm. journal? Mm. Um, mm. Or digital humanities journals. So we could go there. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right. 
But yeah, I don't no, know. I'd be curious to see what you end up doing with it because I think it's really useful, really, for, um, really great stuff, and it's very similar to some of the stuff I was doing during my PhD on um, the old Bailey Online, which was analyzing a, a collection of primary sources rather than secondary sources. Um, but I, those are some of the hurdles that I came up with is people are saying, well, actually what you've analyzed is what someone else applied to the primary sources rather than the primary sources mm. themselves. Right. So you're, you're analyzing a corpus that somebody put together rather than, than getting to that one layer down, which is the history itself. Yeah, I mean, I suppose you could reconceptualize it as an archive, right? I mean, that, 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 is, to, that is to say, um, you know, this is, this is a uh, incredibly well curated digital archive, um, you know, that, that um, exhibits you know many of the same uh, challenges that any archive does. That is of, of selection and uh, so forth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I thought about the Journal of Cultural Analytics as a as a possible uh, venue. Um, yeah. Um, well, keep us informed. It's mm -hmm. interesting to see where you end up. With that. And if you do send it to British Journal, British Studies, or whatever, mm -hmm. I'd be interested to hear what they say. Yeah. Right. No, picking up from that and, and thinking about that, I, I'd written down a phrase you used before actually, the ODMB as an object. That question of what was inherited from the DMB and what's from the, the 21st century office strikes me as all the more interesting yeah. as a question. Sort of breaking down most all of these categories and, and looking at how those might have been interpreted differently between those two different sets of authors. Yeah. So it's a um, particularly pressing question. And just as you were saying, I can see so many ways I would use this teaching historiography, especially to first year students thinking about how history has been written as much as. Uh, Ready. Any final questions before we go on? Since it's dinner time, can I ask you about your spaghetti graphs and where these fit within the, <laughs> again, within the historiography? Because um, if you send that to the Journal of Economic History, they're going to send it back and say there is a table and where are your statistics. Mm -hmm. And I think there's been a shift in the last 10 years, anyway, where people. Social scientists say, that's that's garbage. Show me your numbers. Um, so I'm just curious where uh, you obviously made a choice in the way that you're presenting that, but is that a conscious thing that you've done? And uh, good, good question. Um, so first, to uh, explain where it comes from, this is you know, uh, do I even still have it up? And um, uh, this is from Density Designs raw raw graphs. You, you paste in uh, your Excel spreadsheet, and and they do these um, uh, alluvial diagrams. Um, in in the case of um, this data, um, you know, it's about efficiency. Um, it's about efficiency that that the that the diagram uh, communicates. I think so much more than even a table. Um, and um, you know, I, I don't have any ambition to submit to uh, a journal of economic history. Um, and uh, but I do um, purposefully keep this in a Jupyter notebook. So um, you know, this uh, you know behind behind this is, is of course a, uh, a pandas data frame, um, which uh, you know I could I could produce that. Um, Table quite uh, easily, um, and so I, I do imagine um, when when I publish this work, um, publishing the the process um, in a uh, in a data frame that make, would make available, um, you know, in a Jupyter notebook that would make available the, the tables, um, you know. But but I find as a um, someone who comes to historical data and someone who's trying to interpret it. Um, uh, sort of visualizations um, are incredibly useful. I don't. I mean, I don't disagree with you, and I'm I'm more inclined, at least in the way I work, towards this than the other way. But at the same time, you'd have a lot of people that would say, "Well, if you haven't done the statistic, the appropriate statistical test, you don't know if your visualization is accurate or if it's meaningful." And so, it just I don't know. I guess again, thinking about your peer reviewers, a, a caution that mm -hmm. that if you get that reviewer, and you probably should get that reviewer. Um, are you ready to deal with it? Yeah, right. Now, now what, what statistically, I, I, 
I'm basically counting here. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not doing anything. Well, that, somebody that, say, might say like your, your gender thing in the 1920s where you got a bump. They say, well, is that is that a meaningful difference? I see. And you, then you have to say, oh shit. Well, let me see if I can find somebody who can tell me if it's statistically significant. Right. It's yeah. it's just a challenge that I know a lot of digital humanities scholars face. It's, there's a, a book or an article called Outsourcing the Maths, which is basically <laughs> digital humanities scholars are happy to let a tool mm -hmm. show them something without actually knowing the mathematics mm -hmm. behind it. And it's 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 mm -hmm. a bit of a divide between an us and them, and I'm not sure they're wrong necessarily. Isn't this a slightly different case? Like, there's no you're not sampling. I mean, this is the whole all the data is It's not like you're trying to take sample of population and you really have got statistical questions to answer. I would have thought it's a slightly different case. No, I, I mean, I, I've done projects like the 60 degrees of Francis Bacon project, which is highly statistical, and I've collaborated with uh, statisticians on, on that project. Um, this feels like a different uh, mm -hmm. kind of uh, approach. Um, I have spoken with statisticians about this project, and, and you know, they, they have uh, all kinds of ideas of things that you things that you could do in order to sort of correlate the different um, data data points. Um, That's a good example, actually. Correlations between the mother's occupation and the age, of whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And and so that's that's certainly possible, and that, that's the kind of thing that I've uh, spoken with statisticians about. Um, in in a sense, that's that's. Uh, that's the higher hanging fruit here. Like the, the fruit that I'm after here is counting things, um, and um, sim simply to know just how many of entries there are uh, for people alive in a given year. Like I, I don't think that there's anything here that requires much in the way of statistical uh, expertise. Cool. As the screen goes off, that's probably a good point <laughs> to uh, to count to the pub. <laughs> so thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there are no questions from the board. Okay. So I think we should thank Chris one more time.